the next guest, obviously, since it's packed, everybody does, obviously, everybody knows who this is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is Dave McGraney. Uh, the first time I knew anything about him, uh, somebody sent me a link to, oh, the, 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 your first book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had him on the show, and shortly after that, uh, he was on MP NPR. Mm -hmm. The funny part about this is my co-host, Swoopy, who uh, you've seen her around, um, she's in full-time school and, and, and work and all this stuff, so she didn't realize I had him on the show already. And he said, she said, there's this guy. He's on NPR right now. You have to listen to it, and you have to get this guy on the show. I said, I already had. <laughs> so she was like, oh, all right. So... And, and, and I said, yeah, he's also coming to Dragon Con. He said, well, you beat me to it. So, David Graney, he is going to talk about why you're not so smart or how you're less dumb mm -hmm. or well, maybe you are all dumb because here we are. Yeah, are. All of that. All of us. Yeah. And, uh, okay. All right. Why don't you do a thing? Cool. Thanks. Uh, hey. <laughs> wow. Look at all these people. I feel very... Um, I'm gonna try not to move around too much, but I have, have a habit of doing that. I, uh, I feel very fortunate, very lucky to be able to talk about the science of stupidity with so many super smart people like yourselves. And uh, when I say lucky, I really mean that. I mean luck in the scientific sense. And maybe you've never heard of such a thing. And if not, then we'll get to that in just a minute. But what I wanna start with to get us to luck is this idea that, um, all of you in this room have this cognitive bias inside your heads right now, and it's causing you all to believe in a particular misconception. And this is the misconception, okay? You should focus on the successful if you wish to become successful. But the truth of the matter is, when failure becomes invisible, the difference between failure and success may also become invisible. Now, for this to make sense, we have to go back to 1941, to New York City, to an apartment, overlooking Morningside Heights, where a group of mathematical soldiers engaged daily in statistical combat to create equations that would both snuff and spare several hundred thousand human lives. Now, of course, it was war. And war had become so complex, so impossible for one single commander or one single soldier or a president to understand, and there were so many new variables that, uh, it was difficult to proceed. And on, on top of that, they had all these new things. Some of them had just been introduced, like submarines and ship-to-ship -ship combat and air-to-air -air combat and rockets and radar and sonar. And the things that had just been introduced to the world, the World's Fair, were now cracking the world apart. And to modern eyes, it was obvious that what these people needed were computers. But a computer in 1941, you know, it's this big clunky affair made of vacuum tubes and telephone switches, and they're enormous, and there are not very many of them. And you might think, well, just give them calculators. But calculators at the time are, you know, they're mechanical. They're like a hybrid between a, a cash register and a typewriter, so that's no good. But they did have all of the computers they would ever need. It's just that in 1941, the world's most powerful number crunchers ran on toast and coffee. So what they did is they went around, the United States military, they gathered all the smartest people they could find, the mathematicians, the statisticians, the physicists, and they put them together in 11 different research groups, each one with a different specialty. The one pictured here, this is the Philadelphia computing section. It was a group of all female mathematicians who all day long, all week long, for the duration of the war, they wrote out ballistics tables uh, by hand, something you might could do with a smartphone today, but that's, that's the way it worked. And all of these branches, that they, all these different groups, they formed a single new branch in the military called the Department of War Math. <laughs> Which is not true, I made that up completely. <laughs> uh, I just wish it was called the Department of War Math because it was actually known by this very unsexy 1940s term, the Applied Mathematics Panel. And uh, the applied mathematics panel, it worked kind of like this. Um, let's say um, a commander has this problem and they need it solved, they don't know how to solve it, so they call up one of these research groups, they call the head of the, of the uh, mathematics panel and they find the, the person that can help them. And then uh, this person helps the commander and th by doing so, that work later on might even, some of them, they ended up winning a Nobel Prize for advancing their field. But in the moment they were helping this commander win a war for uh, control of the planet. So it was kind of like calling IT. But the thing about it was 
all of these groups, they, um, you've heard of some of the things they did, the, the nuclear bomb, you know, the atomic bomb, the, um, the code breaking, that sort of stuff. But they also worked on things you may have not heard of, like torpedo spreads and bomb sites and how to use radar to control things. And as the war moved forward, they became focused on one problem, and that problem was aircraft survivability trying to keep planes in the sky, having them come home more often than not. And this was a really big problem in the war. In fact, one historian said that the, um, the bomber crews called themselves ghosts already, that they believed that they would die. Maybe not this mission or the next mission, but over the course of 25 missions, yeah, definitely they're probably gonna die. And so they were just going through the motions, trying to contribute to the war effort. And at the very height of the war, it was basically a coin toss, whether or not you would survive 25 missions. It was about 50-50. So if they could increase the odds of these uh, pilots coming home by just 1% or maybe just half of a percent, then that could maybe turn the tide of the war. And so that was the problem they started focusing on. And they went to that apartment that I talked about earlier where the division was called the SRG, the Statistical Research Group. And it was headed up by Abraham Wald, who was probably the greatest statistician of his day. And he was particularly well suited to this problem of aircraft survivability because he had lost his family already in the war. Uh, as he was escaping the Nazi scourge, his family did not. They died in a concentration camp, and he was very eager to turn his exponents and integers into bombs and bullets. So what he did is rather complex uh, overall, but not in the, like, the small scale. He basically determined how well is the percentage chance that this plane is going to make it back, considering how much of resistance it's going to get. And to, do that, what he did is he had all the bomber crews, uh, all the ground crews, whenever a plane would come home, they would mark on a special card that was even simpler than the image that I have up here, where the planes had been damaged. And after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these came back, it started to form this heat map. And you can see that they were mostly shot up in the fuselage, in the tail gunner, and out there along the wings. And this was part of his overall research. And uh, although the overall research was kind of hard to understand, this in particular was very easy to grasp. Uh, and also made this great picture. So the commanders went right away trying to apply this to the war effort, and they started putting the armor on the airplanes where the, they're being hit here. And Abraham Wald said, whoa, wait, stop, whoa, stop, stop everything that you're doing. Uh, probably not as dramatic as that, but I, I think, uh, I do imagine that there's like a commander with like a cigar and he's crunching down on it. He's like, what are you talking about, Abraham? Uh, and what he said was, look, here's the thing. These airplanes made it home, bullet holes and all, okay? So what we're really worried about are the airplanes that didn't make it back. Now, we don't know where they were shot, but we can reasonably assume that they were shot where these planes weren't. So instead of putting the armor where the, where the bullet holes are, don't do that. The holes show where the planes are the strongest. Put them where the holes are missing and that'll get you ahead. That is what they did. That was the right decision, and it did help turn the tide of the war. And the reason he was able to catch this mistake was because he was familiar with something called survivorship bias. And this is something that we all have to contend with. It's uh, the tendency to focus on survivors instead of whatever you would call a non-survivor, depending on the situation. That could be living versus dead. It could be successes versus failures. It could be the winners versus the losers. And whenever any process leaves behind survivors, the non-survivors are often muted, destroyed, or removed from your view. And if that happens, of course, you're going to naturally pay attention to things that aren't muted or removed from view. And if it's a failure, you won't pay attention to that. You'll instead pay attention to the success. And not only do you fail to recognize that what is missing may have held important information, you fail to recognize there's any missing information at all. So what I hope is happening here is that there's, a, there's some sort of question that's bubbling up inside of your mind and that is, if the stakes could have been this high for these people, I mean, we're talking about the fate of the planet, and they could have been so focused on not making stupid, ridiculous mistakes, so much so they had this new division of the military to help them not do that, how could they so quickly make a stupid mistake that could have been disastrous? And if they could so easily make this in their lives, in my life, the stakes aren't nearly this high, Am I making this sort of mistake all the time? Is this bias affecting me? And the answer is, of course, it's, it's happening to you every single day of your life. And I'm gonna run through a couple of examples of ways you can see it in the natural world. One of my favorite examples is, comes from uh, Mike Johnston. He's a photographer, he has this blog, and he had this post uh, on his website about how he takes pictures of uh, log cabins, of uh, frontier log cabins. And people often uh, say to him, you know, looking at his pictures, like, wow, we really lost something over the years, haven't we? And he's like, what are you talking about? Uh, well, I mean, people just knew some tricks about building things that we don't know today. 
And because of that, we can't build anything that lasts like these frontier cabins last. And he says, that's ridiculous. 99% of all the log cabins ever built fell right over. And the only things that are left behind are these very, very, very well-built cabins or cabins who are in an environment that's particularly nice and isn't so hostile. So the survivors of that process are skewing your evidence in the direction of the log cabins that are still standing, and you have an erroneous idea of how the natural world works because of it. Or maybe you have, say, um, in your hometown or your home community, a bunch of super successful restaurants. If you ever find a cluster of super successes, you will oftentimes feel like this may be something that I should get into. Maybe this is a business I should pursue, especially if you see all these restaurants and they have lines out the door and they're making money hand over fist. But whenever you see a cluster of super successes, it's actually evidence that this is a business that you should avoid because what you can't see are the gazillions of restaurants that opened and failed within the first couple of years. And most restaurants do fail within the first couple of years. But when they fail, they go away, they become invisible, and all that's left behind are the super successes that had to be so super successful in that hostile environment to survive that they are all that's left over and now they're super successful and it boggles your mind. Or as Nassim Tlaib says, the cemetery of failed restaurants is very silent. So let's talk about Brad Pitt. So um, everyone has a Brad Pitt in their profession. Every one of you has a Brad Pitt that, in the thing that you do. Someone who is extraordinarily driven, very talented, and super successful, and maybe also ridiculously good looking. And when we see someone like this, we have this urge to ask them for advice. How did you get where you're at? How can I be like the person that you are? And as this is really probably a problematic thing that we are driven to do because as Google engineer Barnaby James says, skill will allow you to place more bets on the table, but it's not a guarantee of success. So think of Brad Pitt like one of those restaurants, okay? So for every one Brad Pitt, and there's only one Brad Pitt, uh, there were thousands and thousands of people who came to Hollywood at the exact same time who were just as good looking, maybe more good looking, just as talented, maybe more talented, just as driven, maybe more driven, but for some variable that they may not be able to put their finger on, they just could not get where Brad Pitt got. And, uh, but people ask Brad Pitt, you know, how do, I get ex how do I succeed? How do I not fail? He can't give you advice on how not to fail because all of his decisions worked out for him. What you're missing out on is this giant bank of information of people who did fail who could give you advice on how you should not do the things that they did, but that's not what we do. And that's why Barnaby James continues by saying, beware advice from the successful which is not what we tend to do. We tend to fetishize and sacralize the successful people and businesses. We want to interview CEOs and find out about their biographies. We want to buy books that give you a step-by-step -step guide of how to do what I did to get where I'm at. But as uh, the great psychologist Daniel Kahneman wrote, um, a stupid decision that works out well becomes a brilliant decision in hindsight. So if you make a terrible mistake and you get removed from the pool of people who give out advice, we'll never know about the mistake. But if you happen to do something stupid and it works out for you, that becomes, oh, wow, we should maybe do what that guy did. And if you look through the biographies, he's done this. He said, if you look through the biographies of these iconic companies and you try to find uh, what it is that separates them, he suggests you go to a moment when things were really chaotic for them and see if any decision that they made at, the, at that time, anyone predicted the outcome of that decision. Would it, would it end up going where they believed it would go? And he says, it never works out that way. Through hindsight bias, uh, chaos in the moment looks like certainty later on. And he said, if you group all of these successes together and see what makes them similar, the only real answer will be luck. Now, usually people get freaked out right here because especially in uh, American culture, the idea that you succeed through luck is kind of gives you this crestfallen feeling. Um, it makes you feel icky because you, don't, you feel like your hard work is what gets you where you're going. But that's only if you have a pre-scientific understanding of what luck is. And we have a post-scientific understanding of luck. We're just beginning to crack it. And that's thanks to uh, the hard work of scientists like uh, Richard Wiseman, a friend of the skeptic community, Richard Wiseman. He did a study that lasted 10 years and he brought together 200 uh, subjects. And he had them, uh, first of all, self-identify as either being lucky or unlucky. And so they would say, you know, things tend to work out for me or things don't tend to work out for me. They would interview their friends and family. Their friends and family would say, yeah, things don't usually work out for them. Or they'd say, things always seem to work out for him. Um, 
And then he actually looked through their uh, life history, and it was true. Some people do tend to be lucky, and some people tend to be unlucky. But what he hypothesized was that what we're actually seeing here is the measurable output of a certain type of behavioral routine. It's a way that a person interacts with chance, and the result is something we call luck or not luck. One of the um, ways he researched this is he handed out uh, newspapers to all these people. He said, if you can find all the photographs in this newspaper in under a minute, and you can tell me how many there are, I'll give you $250, no questions asked. And so people were highly motivated and they grabbed the newspaper and they started searching. But what he didn't tell them was that on the second page of the newspaper, he wrote in big bold letters, stop counting, there are 43 photographs in the newspaper. <laughs> and the lucky people more often than not saw this and turned it in. And the unlucky people more often than not didn't see this and didn't, uh, or, and didn't see the thing and didn't turn it in the way the lucky people did. And he said, this is how it works. Um, the harder they look, the less they saw, and so it is with luck. Unlucky people miss chance opportunities because they're too focused on looking for something else. It's like um, people who uh, hate their job, but they don't look for another job until they lose their job. You know? uh, people who are narrowly focused, they're goal-oriented, they seek security and control, they prefer routines. These tend to have a pattern that ends up in being unlucky. And people who are always looking for something else, even if they like what they're doing right now, People who easily abandon routines and are open to new experiences and willing to fail and don't even care if they do fail, they just keep going. Those people are the ones that we generally call lucky. He has this thought experiment that he, um, he had a, did an interview with Skeptical Inquirer magazine in which he explained this thought experiment. It goes like this. Imagine there's this orchard, this magical orchard that has all these great uh, apple trees and they're all brimming with apples. And we apply these two different strategies of dealing with chaos to these apple trees. One strategy is with the first tree you find that has a lot of apples in it, you stay there and you keep going back to it over and over again. And over time, your basket has fewer and fewer apples until you're almost getting none at all. And you can, you can imagine that sequence going for thousands of baskets and it getting poorer and poorer. Versus the other strategy, which is, I don't care how many, uh, I don't have, I care how great this tree is, I'm going to go ahead and switch to another tree immediately and then switch from that one and keep going and go everywhere around the orchard, a different tree every day. And people who do it like that, sometimes the tree isn't as good as the last one. Sometimes the fruit is rotten, but they tend to have more apples overall in a long sequence. And if you change the apples to experiences and realize that every once in a while an experience works out for you, these people have more once's in a while's, and therefore things tend to work out for them more often than not, and we call them lucky. He says, successful people tend to make it more probable that unlikely events will happen to them while trying to steer themselves into the positive side of randomness. So to sum this story up before we go on, luck is just what we call the result of a human being interacting with chance in the same way over time. And some people are just better interacting with chance than others. And survivorship bias is an advice business that's a monopoly run by survivors, mostly lucky people. And those who fail are rarely asked for advice on how not to fail. And if you only learn from survivors, you only learn from the lucky, your knowledge of the world will be strongly biased and enormously incomplete. So, this is what I write about. This is what I usually do whenever I write about a subject. I try to take um, all this research and compile it into something that's, that's easy to understand, not just for lay people, but for a general audience. And what's uh, great about this wing of psychology, of psychology, the science of self-delusion and the psychology of decision-making, of rationality and of reason, is that it's a young science within a, a young science. And it only really goes back really to the 1960s and 70s because uh, before then, uh, before the, people weren't really trying to crack that code, they relegated this idea of what is reason and how does it work to philosophy. You know, they put over here in one column emotion and over here in this other column you have reason and emotion is animalistic and primal and primitive and it has to be tamed by reason which is evolved and human and glorious and beautiful. And uh, we didn't start twisting those ideas together until rather recently. And uh, Peter Wason was one of the first people to work on this. And Peter Wason invented some games that can illustrate some really great concepts. And we're going to play one right now. This is usually really fun in a big group of people. Okay, so I'm going to play a game. Rules are very simple. All right. It's going to require a very little bit of effort from you. But here we go. Um, I'm going to think of three numbers in the entire universe. And if you've ever heard of this before, just let everybody else play along. Three numbers in the entire universe. I'm going to use a rule to pick out those numbers, and you have to you have to figure out the rule I'm using to pick out the numbers. Okay. So what I want you all to do is raise one hand, and when you think you've figured out the rule, lower your hand. Okay. So do that. Okay. Here we go. First set of numbers. Can you figure out the rule I'm using to pick out these numbers? Two, four, six. If you think you've already figured out the rule, lower your hands. Almost everybody's already done it. Uh, it's not hard. 
this is not connected to that sequence, but it's using the same rule, okay? Same rule, 10, 12, 14, have you figured out the rule? Wonderful. And 24, 26, 28, have you figured out the rule? Okay, everybody, but just a couple people think they figured out the rule. You can lower your hands. Okay, the next stage of, the, of this uh, game is that you're going to use my rule to pick out three numbers. So uh, let's say uh, you use my rule to pick out three numbers. Just tell me three numbers. Fantastic, you did get it right. That is using my rule, thank you very much. Now, what this is meant to illustrate, what Peter Wace was trying to illustrate is that what we tend to do is we find um, something out there in the natural world. We make an observation and then we form a hypothesis about how that uh, thing is happening, what is behind it, and then we go searching for confirmation of our hypothesis and once we have confirmed our hypothesis, we stop looking for more information because these also use my rule, one, two, three, and 33, 3,371, and 99,999. Because my rule is just any three numbers, one bigger than the last. But <laughs> everybody thought they had the rule figured out, and that's because of confirmation bias. Even skeptics can't help it because conf confirmation bias is how the brain naturally works. It's what we do. We don't naturally seek disconfirmation. When Wason asked people to seek disconfirmation by no matter what they thought the rule was, try to ask if it's something other than their rule, they tended to immediately get to the point very quickly because they had to keep abandoning their hypotheses. You may have seen this used in other ways. Now, You've got survivorship bias, you've got confirmation bias, these are cognitive biases, that's a lot of the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes are what I write about. But it really wasn't my entry point into this world. I, I was looking for a science beat that I could uh, you know, really dig into, and I discovered it through uh, Darren Brown. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but this blew my mind. Darren Brown did this uh, experiment, this uh, for, t for TV experiment, where he, had, uh, he would ask for directions in a crowded city, and then someone would come up to him and, and, uh, and he'd say, hey, can I get directions to so-and-so place? And they say, no problem, it's over here. And while they're giving directions, they have two people holding this giant picture will step between him and the other person. One of the people switches out with him and then they, they walk away and now it's a completely different person who is asking for directions and people tended not to notice. Sometimes it would be a different skin tone, sometimes it would be a different gender, still did not notice. And I could not believe this was true. So I started looking through the scientific literature. I had a, a background in psychology and journalism, so I was like, this is something completely new to me. And it's called change blindness, and actually it has a, a very long pedigree. Uh, some of the most recent work by Daniel Simons in 2004. Now he did a more scientific version of this with NOVA, and it worked exactly the same way. Uh, person asking, person giving, people walk between, switch out the person, the person doesn't notice. Now in the more scientific version that NOVA did, um, half of the people didn't notice. And in the actual research, it's half the time that people don't notice usually, which is still unbelievable to me. And so, but looking into it, it now makes more sense because once you understand that the brain doesn't interact with reality, it interacts with a model of reality that the brain itself generates. And that is what leads to these sort of in real life illusions because the model of reality is much simpler than all these particular details about what the person looks like that we don't pay attention to unless we absolutely need to. Another great example of that is this uh, checker shadow illusion. If you've never seen this before, this is impossible to believe. A and B are the exact same color. Now, I can tell you that a, a thousand times. I can give you uh, Photoshop and let you play around with the pixels. You will never be able, you'll see it for sure. But once we go back to the image, you'll never believe it. Now, I can connect them and you'll instantly lose the illusion. There they are, same color. But if I take that back, there we go again. And that's because it has to do with the way the brain gets uh, confused by artificial shadows. But the point is that uh, the brain lies to you is the whole point, right? The, it's generating a representation of reality that evolutionarily speaking is more useful than the truth, but it is not the absolute truth. So that is all well and good for people like ourselves who love this stuff, who love talking about it, who love exploring it. But the general public, which this is a central tenet of the skeptics, we would understand that, but uh, one of the general public doesn't know this. <laughs> and uh, they really don't know it though. In a, a nationwide poll, 63% of people said that everything the eyes capture is recorded. Uh, every single thing you see. Change blindness is impossible, say 63% of the American public, because the eyes work like a camera. And once it goes into your eyes, it stays in there forever as a memory that is perfect and unchangeable, and it's locked in, and it's a one-to-one -one representation. And because of that, 
37 percent of people in the United States say the only evidence required to convict a person of a capital offense is eyewitness testimony. And that's very frightening because eyewitness testimony is worthless. It's, it's, it's as change blindness shows you, right? Um, no, we have imperfect, inaccurate senses that are very narrow and they go and become memories that are malleable and changeable and they degrade over time. And all of this is uh, part of a model that introduces into consciousness things that we would like to be true and deletes from consciousness things that we'd rather not be true. So, the, um, the takeaway from this particular part of, of what I'm talking about is, is pretty simple. You are unaware of how unaware you are and you are the unreliable narrator in the story of your life. <laughs> or, in even other words, and spread this around, this is my gospel, common sense can't be trusted. And when you hear somebody go, that's just common sense, yeah, okay. Uh, if somebody says, uh, well, common sense dictates that, <laughs> I don't, don't trust that. And one of the weirder things about common sense is it gives us things that we have to unlearn. And uh, one of the things that everyone in this room has unlearned, but there's a remnant of it that still exists, and I've seen it all over the place today, uh, something that uh, this remnant of common sense we've unlearned uh, appears in our mythology and in our fiction, and that is uh, a topic that is near and dear to all of our hearts, and that is laser eyes. You know what I'm talking about, laser eyes. We've got the heat vision of Superman. Don't tell me it's not heat vision, it's heat vision. Uh, the... Uh, power bolts that come out of uh, the bad guys in Dragon Ball Z, the, um, the energy blasts of, um, of uh, the Iron Giant, uh, who he can't control them and it actually embarrasses him when he uses them in self-defense. It doesn't mean to hurt people. Oh, he's, uh, um, it could be the concussive blasts of, uh, of Cyclops and he's worried he's gonna hurt the things he loves or destroy the things he finds beautiful. We use these in all sorts of ways to tell stories. And they, you see them across all cultures and across all eras. Laser blasts out of our eyeballs is something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. And it's kind of got, had seen a resurgence here lately. You can go to this website called Laser Eyes. <laughs> and you can drop in a picture, and with no Photoshop skills, it automatically puts laser beams in people's eyes. This is actually what they show as examples of how to use their service. Um, now, this, is, this was invented in response to public demand because this was very popular last year on the internet. Babies with laser eyes. <laughs> very, very popular. And of course, if you're interested in creating these and sharing them, you can go to babieswithlasereyes.tumblr.com. Pick out your favorites, submit your own. Um, but this is not a new idea. This is an ancient idea. In fact, uh, if you go to the Hindu text, Shiva one time got very annoyed with someone and opened up his third eye and used a super beam out of his super head to super incinerate someone to ashes. And uh, in the Celtic text, you have Baylor, who is this giant cyclops who can use the power of the sun to destroy armies with his single eye, which is pretty rad. But the, uh, these are old, old, old ideas, thousands of years old. But back in the day that people were sharing these ideas like this, it wouldn't have been considered all that fantastical because for a very long time, the way that we understood how eyes work was through something called the extra mission theory of vision. And the extra mission theory of vision is um, the idea that we see by putting, taking energy bolts and emitting them from our eyes and touching the world around us and feeling it with those energy bolts. Uh, the ancient Greeks believed this, many of them did, they wrote about it. One of the things that they used to explain it was if you look at like a, a, a deer at night, or if you look at any animal at night, you see reflected in their eyes, they didn't use the word reflected, they saw the fire in their eyes, and they thought it really was fire in their eyes. In fact, Plato said, that's how we see, is that we shoot fire out of our eyes. And the reason that when we're contemplating the meaning of truth of one of our best friends, that we don't engulf his face in flames, is, um, is that he said it was, quote, a gentle fire, a gentle fire, caressed the world. And of course, some people, they were skeptical, and they said, um, so how come you can't see at night and, uh, if you're shooting fire out of your face? <laughs> and uh, he said that because it has to mingle with another fire, and so there has to be like a campfire, and then your fire touches that fire, and they coalesce into the things that you see. Or it could be the, you know, the, sun, the fire in the sky that's doing the same thing. And people are like, hmm, that makes sense. 
Very smart people said that makes sense. Uh, Ptolemy, Euclid, uh, Galen, all of them endorsed this. Galen was wishy-washy about it, but he finally said, uh, I go with extra mission. Uh, very learned, very smart people, the people who were supposed to be you know, the originators of our entire civilization, believed that the way that you saw, the way you read, was actually through headlights. Um, <laughs> so, we believed this for a long time, all the way up until about 1011, when uh, Al-Hazin came along. That's how, what he's known in the Western world, has his name in the Western world, Al-Hazin. He was very interested in things like color and um, refraction, reflection, angles, uh, lenses, that sort of thing. And based on what he was learning, he was like, this extra mission thing cannot work. He wrote a book called The Book of Optics in 1011. Uh, that eventually, uh, it, it developed the intermission theory of vision that eventually got translated to Latin and then published as a book and it fell into the hands of the Enlightenment and then it, people like Kepler built on that and through all of their hard work, you people in here today don't believe in the extramission theory of vision. But it's not so much you don't believe in it, it's that you unlearned it. Let me explain what I mean by that. Everybody's probably heard of Jean Piaget, the, uh, the great psychologist. Now, his work has been expanded upon and refined since his day, but if you recall, he's the one who came, uh, discovered the uh, stages of cognitive development in children. And that um, bef there's one stage in particular, the pre-operational stage, is somewhere before the ages of five or seven. And kids are really bad at something called conservation, which is ratios and fractions and imagining a material moving from one container to another. You've probably seen this. If you have kids, do this, because it may hurt your feelings, but do this. Um, you, take, you take a short glass and you fill it with a liquid and you take a tall glass and you have the child look at it and you say, okay, I'm going to pour this in this glass and you pour it in the tall glass and you put it down and you say, okay, now does the tall glass have the same amount of liquid in it or more? And they usually say more. Um, you have to get to a certain age where you can cognitively get over your intuition in this matter. And he wrote in this research that uh, children at that age also tend to say that vision is accomplished through shooting beams of energy out of your eyes and touching the world around you. And he thought, wow, that sounds a lot like what the Greeks said. I bet that's something we all believe and have to unlearn. But he didn't do research into it. It, was, it wasn't until 1996 that um, Gerald Weiner and Jane Cottrell did uh, research in 1996 about how, um, how does this work? When does it actually uh, stop? What's the cutting off point? And do kids really believe it? And they did about 20 different studies, lots of different methodologies. It's pretty robust stuff. And they found that 49% um, of first graders say that vision is, is accomplished through extra mission. 70% of third graders and 51% of fifth graders in the United States say that extra mission is how we see. But what astonished them, what blew their mind, what really gave them problems was that one third of college freshmen in the United States also. Yes, yes. 33% of college freshmen in the United States believe that vision is accomplished through laser eyes. Now, he wrote, college students were behaving like pre-scientific ancient philosophers despite having received formal education on the topics of sensation and perception. What really bothered him was some of these were his students and they had just taken the part of the class in psychology about eyes. And he, this bothered him so much and uh, he tried to get to the bottom of it. He did some follow-up research and he came to the conclusion that so for some people, you just didn't pay attention to science class, and so you never lost your gut intu intuition of that that's how we see. Your common sense was never thwarted. But for most of the other people, even if they didn't believe specifically in uh, the extra mission, they did believe that it was part of vision. Then, so they, both beliefs uh, coexisted. He actually wrote, and this is a quote from him, correct beliefs often coexist with incorrect beliefs and notions that are strikingly resistant to change. He said that it was uh, a powerful intuitive perception, something that we can't get rid of, something that just happens in our minds. And um, because of that intuition, we started telling us uh, these stories to ourselves, these post hoc, ad hoc rationalizations in the form of narratives that we also call just so stories. And just so stories rule the pre-scientific days. All of the superseded scientific theories are just so stories. My favorite one is this one. It's the goose tree. Now, for a very long time, for like about 700 years we know, probably going back much farther than that, people believed that there was a tree out there that when it grew to full size, these buds would come off of it. And when those grew to full size, they would grow wings and then pop off and fly away. And that's where geese come from. And very learned people believed this. In fact, they used it to uh, eat meat whenever they were giving up meat for lint because it was neither fish nor fowl. So it was very uh, useful in that regard. And the reason they believed it was because they would find these goose-ish looking barnacles. Other cultures think they look like something else. They would find these goose-ish looking barnacles attached to driftwood, 
and it would be floating in the water or it would, go, it would come up on shore. And then they would, uh, they would assume that, well, I, I bet I know what's happening here because there's a certain type of goose that's not around during the time of year that the barnacles are really all over the place. So there's probably a tree out there and the tree grows these uh, buds that turn into those geese and sometimes the, the branch breaks off and falls in the water and that's what that is. And people say, eh, sounds pretty good. And people believe, that, people believe that for at least 700 years. It's in all sorts of great uh, old books. And that's, uh, that's why we call that the goose barnacle and we call that the barnacle goose even till this day. Um, now, the real reason is migration. They didn't know about migration. They didn't know this particular animal migrated in the way that it did. And without that information, this story seemed to be a nice explanation for how things worked. Or you might have uh, this thing. This is the you know, spontaneous generation. Aristotle believed this. Many people believed in spontaneous generation. The idea that if you leave a piece of meat outside long enough, it will turn into flies. It will become flies. Or if you leave a pile of dirty rags in the corner for long enough, it will become mice. It will actually turn into mice. Um, or if you take a, a, a log and you throw it into a fire and you get it hot enough, it will transmogrify into salamanders. Not that salamanders are already in the log and they're escaping a fiery death, that it will turn into salamanders. And there are so many of these. You've got the geocentric model, you've got the the Humeric model of medicine, the idea that all of our health and sickness is the result of the balance of blood and phlegm and black bile and yellow bile. All of this stuff, uh, all these models work because um, this is how we naturally think. You know, until we kept, throughout all of our history, we kept falling into this giant hole of stupid. And the, and the only way we could climb out of that hole was to create a tool by which we could do that climbing. And that tool is, of course, the scientific method. And without it, uh, we get in a lot of trouble because this is the way we naturally think, all right? You have an emotion or an intuition. Then you form a biased conclusion over that. I'm sure you've seen this on Facebook before. Uh, then you seek supporting evidence through motivated reasoning. You stop when you think you've found enough evidence. That's actually called in psychology the make sense stopping rule. Uh, you only question the disconfirmatory evidence. Everything else passes through. You argue for your bolster conclusion with logical fallacies, and then you feel smug. And then you repeat all that if you get challenged, and you avoid all challenges. And the, that's the natural way we think. The unnatural way we think, and there's many ways of going about this, is the way I like to look at the scientific method, is that, you, yeah, you have an emotion or an intuition, but then you form a hypothesis, and you have observation and experimentation. See if it confirms your hypothesis. Then you disconfirm it. And if you disconfirm it well enough, you can let other people replicate what you've done, then you debate, and then you argue, and everybody gets together, and they have parties, and they talk about it, and you can discard or keep it, and then based off everything you learned, you can form a theory, and then you can feel smug. <laughs> of course, that's not what we do naturally. Uh, the way we actually work is we tend to form these ad hoc, post hoc rationalizations in the form of narratives that we also call just so stories. And we don't just do that for the outside world. We also do it for the inside world as well. And this is mo no more starkly represented than in uh, split brain patients. Um, a split brain patient is a person, so their, their left hemisphere and their right hemisphere are no longer communicating well because the corpus callosum, the tissue that uh, connects them, has been almost completely severed in a corpus callosomy. This is done for people who have uh, a certain severe type of epilepsy and it's to help ease the seizure from passing back and forth. Um, what you get is a very interesting phenomenon. Now, I'm going to describe this in very broad and like, you know, simple terms, but it works out like this. The, when you have a split brain patient, you have their right hemisphere, which each hemisphere controls a different eye or receives information from a different eye. So what the right hemisphere sees, the left hemisphere does not. But also the left hemisphere is responsible or mostly responsible for our production of language. It's called the left brain interpreter. Um, and so the, in the left hemisphere, a lot of explaining ourselves to ourselves takes place. It's the spokesperson for the organism, the spokesperson for the self. So in experiments, this is all done by Michael, Michael Gazzinigan. Um, you show someone a really funny picture to the right hemisphere and the person laughs. But the left hemisphere notices the organism is laughing, doesn't know exactly why, but when you ask them, hey, why are you laughing? They'll say things like, I can't believe you people do this kind of work. Uh, it's ridiculous, it's wacky. And they laugh. The left brain has just come up with an explanation and kept going to not look back. Or you'll show uh, a picture of something that's um, horrible and grotesque, like a car wreck with mangled bodies, and the person will go, ugh, this is horrible. And you ask them, why, why, why are you feeling that way? And they'll say, um, 
you know, I haven't been feeling very good since lunch. I think uh, I'm, some, uh, I'm maybe coming down with something. They come up with an explanation for, for what they're doing that's a lie, but they don't know that they're lying because this is a natural process that we undergo. It's called confabulation. Confabulation is explaining yourself to yourself with an ad hoc post hoc narr narrative story uh, that is sort of a just so story that you believe and just keep on going and never look back. One of the most interesting ways you can see this, and this is what's illustrated in this picture, uh, you have to imagine that these two sides are divided so that the two uh, eyes can't see what the other one's seeing. The right hemisphere is shown a snow scene, and then you're asked to, to use the hand that's controlled with that hemisphere to point to a corresponding picture. So they point to a snow shovel. And then the left hemisphere is shown a, a chicken foot, and you're asked to point to something that corresponds to it, and they point to a chicken. And then you ask the person to look down, and now, now the left hemisphere, for the first time, sees what both hands have pointed at. And they see a shovel and a chicken, and you ask, why did you point at that? And they say, because you clean out the chicken coop with the shovel. That's confabulation. It's an amazing process. And it, of course, it happens in everyone's heads. It doesn't just happen in people who've had the split brain where it's easy to, to sort it out. A good example of this is the research done by Richard Disbitt and Timothy Wilson in the 70s. I love this. This is one of my favorite studies in psychology. They, had, they set up a, um, a booth with um, stockings, and each one stocking is side by side. There's four different kinds. And as people came through, they told them they were doing market research. They said, will you uh, tell us which one of these stockings you think uh, is the one that you would buy if it was offered. Which one is your favorite? So people would pick the one they thought was their favorite. They'd touch it and they'd stretch it and they, then they would say, why did you pick the one you picked? And people would say, I like the texture, I like the quality, it reminds me of my mom. Um, and uh, <laughs> they said that uh, I picked it because of all sorts of reasons. But they never actually told the people the real reason they picked it. And it's because it has to do with the serial position effect and a couple of other things. But when anything is, is represented in a series like this, from left to right, people who read from left to right like we do would tend to more often than not pick the thing over all the way on the right. And that's what people did. And they, they were expecting this. That's how the research was conducted. So most people picked the one all the way over on the right. But what they didn't tell all the people was that they're all the same stocking. So there's no way they picked it for the reasons they picked. What they actually picked it for was the reasons that they had set up. But not knowing that, they came up with an explanation for their behavior to themselves. They explained themselves to themselves, and it was wrong, and they kept going. And that's confabulation. And you can sum it up with uh, what George Miller said, which is, it is the result of thinking, not the process of thinking, that appears spontaneously in consciousness. We don't actually get to see how the sausage is made. So, but we assume we do a lot of times. And not being aware of the sources of our behavior and our emotions, we'll come up with a good ra story to rationalize them away. Now, you might think that um, the way around this is to be more like Spock. Be more like Data. You know, uh, tame your emotions. Get rid of them as much as you can. Get them all the way down to a manageable box. Or get rid of them all together, like Data. But the research suggests this would be a terrible idea because people who suppress their emotions are far more irrational than people who don't. Antonio Damasio is a neuroscientist who studies people who have had a brain tumor or some sort of injury that causes them to be unable to experience emotions except as a very low light simmer. Might as well not be experiencing them at all. And um, they could be very intelligent people. They could be, score very high on, a, on an IQ test. But if you hand them an IQ test with a red pen and a blue pen and ask them to fill it out, using one or the other, that becomes a 30, 45 minute long decision. They can no longer decide whether or not to pick red or blue because they start to pull out all these logic sequences of, well, here are the good reasons to have a blue pen. Here are the good reasons to have a red pen. And it's back and forth. And it just bogs them down. They can proceed no further. He actually says that based off his research, when emotion is entirely left out of the reasoning picture as happens in certain neurological conditions, reason turns out to be even more flawed than when emotion plays bad tricks on our decisions. In other words, a mind with judgments and decisions corrupted by bias and passion is really the only kind of mind that can choose a path, ascribe value, and get anything done. And part of the reason that that's true is because a mind that has no emotions can't get into stupid arguments on the internet. <laughs> this is Graham's hierarchy of disagreement. I, I suggest you look it up and read all the stuff he wrote about it. It starts at the top. I'm sure you've experienced this on Facebook, or I uh, hope to God you've never commented on a YouTube video, but if you have, this is what this is what you see at the top, refuting the central point at the bottom, calling him an asshat. That's how it works. And um, there's a model out there. So the question we know, what we're getting to here is, well, why are we so flawed in our reasoning? Why are we so biased? What is the, 
there has to be an adaptive purpose to this, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't have stuck around for so long. Or there has to be some reason it doesn't bog us down enough to be detrimental to our uh, evolutionary survival. Well, there's a model out there. This is supported by Steven Pinker and Jonathan Haidt. I like it a whole lot. I think it's an argument that we can lean toward. They're starting to unravel it, and it's this. It's called the argumentative theory by Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber. Find their research as cool stuff. And it works like this. Reasoning is best adapted for its role in argumentation. It makes human communication more advantageous, which should therefore be seen as its main function. The psychology of reasoning suggests that individuals are very bad at logic and probability and statistics and decision making. But reasoning is not a flawed mechanism, it's just biased. And bias, being, having a biased reason for what you believe is not necessarily bad, it's just sacrificing uh, accuracy for speed. And sometimes that's a good idea if you're trying to survive in certain situations. So reason's function isn't to search for truth, but to prove that your hunches are correct to yourself or to another party. So confirmatory thinking is this adaptive trait in group communication because each person argues well for his or her intuitions. And over time, the weak arguments are squashed. So that is that if two people are having a conversation or you're just filling out some sort of test or some sort of IQ thing, you don't actually reason through it. You have to start an argument before reasoning comes online. That unless new information is presented to you in the form of an argument, you don't apply disconfirmatory thinking. I know you felt this if somebody says something ridiculous that you know is not true or it's in your wheelhouse of expertise and you're like, okay, immediately you start constructing the argument against it. Or even if you don't plan to ever have that argument, you might start forming that argument in the shower. Like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> they say basically argumentation activates reasoning. And... Um, that's not, if we, ha now that we have this tool to dig our hole out of that, uh, dig out of that hole of stupid science, science, you then find a way to put argumentation into a framework that elevates it beyond just bickering, and you can really get a lot of stuff accomplished. Politics is argumentation institutionalized. Science is argumentation institutionalized. Jonathan Haidt writes that we must be wary of any individual's reason to, to, to reason, but if you put individuals together in the right way, such as that some individuals can use their reasoning powers to disconfirm the claims of others, you can create a group that ends up producing good reasoning as an emergent property of the social system. So uh, let's, let me show that in a really fun way. This is the uh, ball and bat problem that Daniel Kahneman is famous for creating. It goes like this. Um, a ball and bat together is a dollar and 10 cents. If the bat costs one dollar more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Most people say, 10 cents. Even if you didn't say that, it's the first thing you think of and you have to suppress it because that's what your intuition tells you. And a lot of what we talked about today is about, mm, look out about that intuition, that common sense. Now let's say um, if you statistically imagine a group that acts like a, the way it works out in these experiments, about 90 people out of 100 are going to say 10 cents. And imagine there are 10 naysayers. The naysayers will have to present a good argument. They say, no, look, you know, a, do a dollar more than 10 cents is a dollar 10, a dollar 10 plus 10 is a dollar 20. And that's not right. Five cents plus a dollar more than five cents, a dollar five is a dollar ten. You present it like that, everyone who disagreed will suddenly flip over. The good argument destroys the bad argument in, in a group. Now, a single person may never discover they're wrong, but in a group of arguing people, the truth comes out. So, on the internet, it's a great thing that people argue as to whether or not it's good to spank people. Uh, uh, before we had the internet, you might live your entire life never having your beliefs confronted. Now, every single thing you have an opinion about has your belief confronted, whether it's whether or not The Avengers was a good movie, whether or not Fettuccine Alfredo was delicious, whether or not climate change is real. These are things that people argue about online. And the suggestion from the argumentative theory is that this is making us all smarter as a group. The, uh, right now, the, the problem is, uh, should we have gun control or not in the United States, and how strong should it be? That argument is playing out right now. The, uh, there's not really a not a, enough evidence from the scientific community to favor one side or the other, and we're going to work it out. So, yes, every individual thinks like this. Everybody thinks that they are the smart person, everybody else is ridiculous. But uh, as a group, things tend to work out, and reason allows people who have the right answer, this is Hugo Mercier, to find arguments to convince the others, and allows those who have the wrong answer to accept these arguments and to see their strength. But it can take some time. So what I'm saying is, if you're in the skeptic community and you're really involved in it, hold 
fast, okay? Because what you're doing is actually changing the world. You're, you're the people who are good at arguing and are presenting the best arguments, and all the arguments you're having online are going to change things. And it may take a long time to get everybody to flip over, but the people with the best argument always win. It may take a couple thousand years, but eventually somebody will present the argument that allows people to see correctly, literally, right? Or it may just take one person in a very intense situation to explain to everybody what's missing. So, it's true, yes. You're unaware of how unaware you are. You're the unreliable narrator in the story of your life, but with the tool of science, the thing that digs us out of the hole stoop, placed into a, a uh, framework in which argumentation can create good results, it's now true that you can say, yes, you are not so smart. But thanks to the application of these things that we figured out, after a couple thousand years, you are now less dumb. Thank you. I didn't plan to take questions, but I have a little extra time, so I can take two or three questions if you want to do that. If not, that's cool too. At the mic right there. Okay. Or just leave. Yeah. Uh, you said with survivorship bias, if you're only looking at successful people, you're not necessarily going to be able to replicate that success. And if you're missing all of the failures, then you're missing a huge part of the story. So then my question for you is, how do you get those stories of all the failures? If all of that becomes suppressed, how do you actually go out and find that and find the things that you shouldn't be doing? I don't, I mean, I think we'll have, I don't know the answer, but I would suppose we'd have to create some sort of new framework to gather that stuff. I mean, the internet's helping a lot because a lot of people can share what they've done. If you go to like a lot of Reddit threads about certain topics, a lot of people come in and go, yeah, that happened to me, but here's what it worked out for me. I think if you specifically ask for that in like a big enough room of people talking, you might actually get it. So I think we have to create it maybe. Okay. Yeah. Hey there. Yeah. Um, in your latest episode of your podcast, you talk about Extinction Burst, uh, briefly the bad burst of uh, oh, behavior. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you mentioned uh, you yourself are, are, have been subject to classical conditioning in the form of uh, feeling nauseated when you think of tequila. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. if there was a story behind that that we might be able to relate to oh, being well, here at Dragon I, Con. Yes, I used to drink Two Fingers tequila exclusively until it exclusively made me vomit my brains out. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Ever since then, I'd, if I just see the bottle, I'm reminded of how awful my digestive system handles tequila. So I, I, I can only drink tequila and margaritas now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just read uh, Harry Potter fan fiction that mentions the same experiment you just uh, told us about the numbers with the even numbers and, and all yeah. that. And I was wondering if you had any other like, quick little like uh, conversational experiment type things that are similar to the um, number. I mean, one of, of the fun numbers. ones is the waste and selection task, but um, I'd have to show you a diagram because it's a, you ask, it's about cards. That's, that's a terrible example. <laughs> I'll tell you some fun stuff about survivorship bias. You know how people always think that um, music from previous eras is better than today's music? <laughs> that's not true. It's just that all the crappy music doesn't survive because nobody listens to it anymore. 90% of all the music sucks, and that 10% that's good lives on through the eras. And so we always look back at like previous eras of art and pre old cars. We look at uh, you know, old music and we think it's superior to what we have today. But you know, the truth is that it's just the good stuff survives. And of course, all we then see from past eras is the good stuff. So, as an example, um, there's one also about prisons that was pretty neat. The, um, look how uh, look how dumb criminals are of course they get caught all the time they're you know you can look at they, they just uh, you go to a, uh, the average prison and look at the kind of people who are in the prison I've heard someone say that to me before and um, but only the prisoners that aren't good at robbing things and doing crime are the ones who get caught so obviously your data is skewed toward people who get caught right so survivorship bias pops up in all sorts of places with the um the study with the eyes and the house students uh, interpreted all that. The first graders were at 49% and the <laughs> second graders were at 70%. What's the reason for that jump? Um, no one knows for sure, uh, uh, but some of the speculation was that they just get, they're just they now getting exposed to um, pop culture and they can understand it and they play act it and maybe that's corrupting them, but nobody actually knows for sure. All right. How did he frame that question? Because that's important. 
how did he frame that question? Yeah, I don't in the research. I don't remember. <laughs> that's that's really going to be what determines how people answer. It's based on how it's framed. The I don't remember how he asked the question. Sorry. Oh well. <laughs> Hey, what's the name of your podcast? Oh, you are not so smart. Okay. Um, also, you talked about how uh, you know people who don't have uh, emotions usually are not able to make quick, fast decisions, things like that. Can you recommend like maybe other studies of people to read to learn more about that? The using. I'm sorry. Well, like, people like who don't have emotions. Oh yeah, it's called thing. Descartes' Error. That's the uh, that's the book that is only about that. That's that was written by Antonio Damasio. It's on Kindle. You can get it anywhere.